In their day, the pioneers of free market capitalism were widely regarded as radicals. Some of their admirers still call them classical liberals. It is appropriate to consider them at this point in the course, however, for chronological reasons and because the ideas they developed were to become central to 20th century conservatism. Adam Smith's Inquiry into the Wealth of, Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, argued against protective tariffs and government monopolies and in favour of the free market. The invisible hand of the market, wrote Smith, will adjust the economy more accurately and more equitably than the interfering hand of government. Entrepreneurs will flourish and consumers will enjoy ever-improving goods at ever-decreasing costs. David Ricardo, a wealthy businessman who took up economics after reading Smith's great work, explored the advantages to the nation of economic specialization just at the time that Britain's textile magnates were learning how to mass produce goods, subdivide labor, and enjoy massive economies of scale. James and John Stuart Mill, principal figures in the early history of utilitarianism, dismayed the conservatives of conservatives of their own day by favouring the separation of church and state, denying the existence of natural law, and arguing that women should have political rights. Their individualism and their central principle that society should be conducted for the greatest good of the greatest number have nevertheless been important elements of the libertarian side of modern conservatism. We saw last time how Peel, by repealing the Corn Laws, was bringing Britain more nearly to a condition of free trade than ever before. He was ultimately responding to these theorists and demonstrating British conservative acceptance of modern capitalism. Well, I think it's important, first of all, to recognise that there's nothing natural about capitalism. It had to be invented, and its inventors had to overcome many practical and intellectual obstacles. British life in the 18th and early 19th centuries was only gradually emerging from tradition-bound relationships. One of the most important ideas which had a very tenacious hold on the minds of generations of people was the idea of the just price. It was still widely accepted. For decades or even centuries, some prices, like the price of a loaf of bread, stayed the same. And if prices went up because there was a shortage, there were food riots because the rioters felt that the, uh, there was a violation of the just price. And we've got records of rioters seizing bread, but then actually paying the, just, the old just price, but refusing to pay the new higher price. It was widely believed, particularly among economic theorists, that the poor must be kept poor or they would do no work. In other words, that as the Bible says, the poor you shall have always with you. There will always be poverty. This isn't something which is going to be abolished. In our day, now, we hold out the prospect that hard work will make you prosper. But then the feeling, which was expressed by Bernard de Mandeville in the early 18th century and by many other writers on economics, was that the poor must be kept poor. The theory was, if wages rise, it isn't that the poor will get wealthy, it's that they'll work for fewer hours and then they'll drink away their earnings. So it's also socially important to keep the poor poor, to keep them at work. Now, the prevailing theory before Adam Smith was that of mercantilism. And the, one of the governing assumptions of mercantilism was that one nation's gain was another one's loss. There were intense trade wars in the 17th and 18th centuries because the, the British and the French and the Dutch all assumed that if one nation got wealthier, it could only be because one of the others had got poorer. Only very, very slowly and gradually did they realise that economic activity can increase everyone's wealth. In other words, that it's not a zero-sum game. As the reach of European colonial empires increased in the 18th century, as Britain began to conquer India and create literally a world bestriding empire, the old idea came to seem more implausible and the possibility of collective enrichment became possible. Well, important economic ventures prior to 1750 were nearly always undertaken through the grant of royal charters that excluded competition. Uh, companies like the East India Company, which had a monopoly right to trade beyond the Cape of Good Hope. The Virginia Company, which set up some of the American colonies. And of course, they, uh, 
they exercised all the usual abuses of monopolies. The prices they charged were too high, the goods they produced were of poor quality, and because they were monopolies, they were permitted to become inefficient. Mercantilism and inefficiency and monopoly, these are all the things that Adam Smith was opposed to. He was a Scottish intellectual, and in 1776, he published An Inquiry into the Wealth of Nations. Now, Smith's title is itself a very illuminating one. He, sa he says this, I'm inquiring into why certain nations are wealthy. In other words, the thing that has to be explained is wealth. We don't have to explain poverty because we've always had plenty of poverty with us. What's surprising and noteworthy is that now we've got some wealth as well. That's the thing that's got to be explained. We today live in a very, very wealthy society where we can afford to ask the question, why is there still poverty? But throughout most of world history, that never had to be explained. It was just obvious. Adam Smith brought together the insights of numerous writers on economics, philosophy and politics to create a kind of general theory of capitalism. Smith showed that individuals serving their self-interest will also provide everything that the society needs. And this is what's so um, seductive about Smith's theory. It isn't, because, it isn't because people are altruistic that society is well served, it's because they're selfish that it's well served. Individuals provide goods and services because other people will pay for them. And Smith says at one point, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our necessities, but of their advantages. Smith recognised that competition will ensure a steady fall in prices and a steady rise in the quality of goods on sale. After all, if ten different companies are all trying to produce the same commodity, all ten of them have got an incentive to improve the quality of the good, and also to reduce the price of it, because better quality and lower price will attract consumers. And that means that if you've got competition, you've got the built-in probability of the improvement of the goods and the, de and the decline in their prices. And, Smith showed, price mechanisms will ensure that supply meets demand. If the price of a commodity is high, more people will enter the competition to make it because they see a profitable opportunity in being able to sell that commodity. Again, they enter the com competition for purely selfish reasons, but in, in but in making more of the commodity, they tend to bring its price down and they tend to improve its quality. That's why competition is so good. And he says, even if the makers of a commodity, the many different makers, create a price-fixing agreement, they try to create an oligopoly, someone outside that arrangement is going to be drawn in to make the items and undersell the cartel. In other words, it's very, very difficult to preserve a monopoly position if any number of actors are entitled to enter the market freely. And that's why government-supported monopolies are so bad. Smith made one very, very important, crucial conceptual breakthrough. He assumed that societies are dynamic, not static, and that their economies will develop. Again, for generations, the assumption had been that there's a more or less fixed amount of economic activity in the world and that some people are getting more and some are getting less. But Smith starts to think about it in a different way, to think that the whole situation is being transformed by economic activity. Profitable manufacturing, said Smith, leads to accumulations of money, i.e. capital. And that can be invested in bigger ventures, which will employ more people and make more goods, and enable them to be distributed more widely. And, said Smith, everybody benefits. Even the poor men in industrializing Britain, although they were poor, they were less poor than their predecessors. They were living better than ever before. It's true that their homes might look rough, but, he says, they have clothes, they have knives and forks, cutlery, plates, windows in their houses, and many other manufactured items. Quote, the accommodation of a European prince does not always so much exceed that of an industrious and frugal peasant as the accommodation of the latter exceeds that of many an African king, the absolute master of the lives and liberties of 10,000 naked savages. In other words, even our peasants are becoming as wealthy as the kings of the, of the Africans. Smith also noted that population was rising as productivity increased partly because improved wages tended to reduce infant mortality, 
more children lived in a wage economy than had previously been the case. Now, in a famous early chapter of the uh, Inquiry into the Wealth of Nations, Smith also talked about the division of labour. And he describes the way in which uh, pin making, the making of pins, has been transformed in Britain. There was a time when a master pin maker would do every process on his own. But then the industrial pin manufacturers brought together lots of men and each one would just do one very, very simple task. And he said there's a massive increase in efficiency when you break down the various components of the job. It isn't as though 20 men take, make uh, 20 times as many pins per day. They make more about 100 or 150 times as many as one pin maker working on his own. The division of labour is crucial to Smith's scheme. Now, of course, he also admitted that the downside of the division of labour is that the work becomes more and more boring and limited and stultifying. And uh, less skill is needed. An old master pin maker had to be able to do many, uh, ocu uh, many processes, whereas the new factory worker just has to do one and it can be learned very quickly and it's dreadfully boring. Smith, in fact, said, the government ought to intervene to be sure that everyone has some education, partly to offset the monotony which they're going to have to endure in their working lives. Smith rejected the idea that government-granted monopolies were necessary or beneficial. And he rejected the idea that the government ought to impose tariffs on trade. He also favoured the repeal of legislation that limited the mobility of labourers or restricted the size of enterprises. All these things should be left alone. Let the market decide what's going to happen. If a man wants to move elsewhere to look for work, let him do so. If an industrialist has got the, the enterprise and the energy and the capital to set up a big industry, let him do so. Central to Smith's thinking is, as much economic laissez-faire as possible. And of course, that's why the rising capitalists of England, who felt themselves to be excluded from power, that's why they liked him. And the book caught on among them. Even though the inquiry into the wealth of nations is littered with ruthless and harsh remarks against, about the rapacity of the capitalists, he certainly didn't idealise them at all. In other words, there didn't seem to be anything conservative about it at the time. It was a manifesto of a transformed world. The early advocates of these ideas were called radicals, and for their time, they were radical. Smith's successors, the next generation of economic theorists, indicated some of the complexities that develop in an industrial system and the class conflicts that they were likely to produce. One of the most famous is Thomas Malthus, a clergyman, and uh, one of the reasons the uh, econo economics is sometimes called the dismal science is because Malthus uh, had such a gloomy outlook about the, the, the prospects for economic changes. He said, it's true that we're getting more economic growth, but we're also getting more population growth, and the population is always going to, is rising and is always going to rise much faster than the, uh, than the growth in the food supply. The food supply always grows at an arithmetic rate, whereas the population grows at a geometric rate. When you have more people surviving, they give rise to, to many more children themselves. And that means that very quickly, rising populations are always going to bump up against famine. Famine, hunger, malnutrition, war and epidemic. To Malthus, those were the what we now call the Malthusian checks on the development of population, because the poor always breed faster than the ability of the land to feed them. Malthus says, it seems kind to feed the poor, but if in doing so you enable them to reproduce, you're really being cruel because you're bringing more mouths into the world that cannot be fed. Malthus doubted whether moral restraint or delays in the age of marriage would be sufficient to counteract his logic. In other words, he could see if people didn't marry and didn't have sex until they were 30, then the restricted fertility which would ensue would mean that populations could restrict themselves and then perhaps we'd get rising wealth without continued chronic poverty. But he said, I just can't imagine that people will have the self-discipline to do that. Another of these theorists was David Ricardo. He was particularly interested in the relationship or conflict between the landed wealth and the industrial wealth, something we've already looked at in its political manifestations. Ricardo was an English Jew who married a Quaker and he made a great fortune on the stock market. He was a shrewd investor in the era of the Napoleonic Wars. 
He was an expert at creating powerful abstractions to understand economic processes. That is, to look at the complicated reality and strip it down to the essentials and then look at the way in which various factors in economics um, interacted. The abstractions which are central to macroeconomics. In the last years of the Napoleonic Wars, the landowners favoured by the Corn Laws uh, were favoured by the Corn Laws, which kept out cheap foreign food supplies. We looked at this in the previous lecture. The industrialists, industrialists felt aggrieved by the Corn Laws because high food prices, the prices forced them to pay higher wages. After all, from the factory factory owner's point of view, even keeping the workforce at subsistence, the workers have to be fed enough to live or there's not going to be any work at all. So that meant, from the industrialist point of view, that the actual profits of industrialization were accruing not to the industrialists, who'd taken all the uh, initiatives, but to the landlords, whose rents kept rising. Ricardo was a gifted parliamentarian, a member of parliament, and he spoke passionately against the Corn Laws, but he didn't live to see their repeal. In the next generation was John Stuart Mill, one of the most interesting people in British intellectual history. He brought together the insights of libertarian philosophy with classical economics. Apart from anything else, John Stuart Mill is the author of one of the very best autobiographies of the Victorian period. It's a great classic in its own right. His father, James Mill, was himself a philosopher, but worked as an official of the East India Company. James Mill, the father, believed that in education of children, a lot of time was wasted and that it ought not to. So when, Mill was, so when jo John Stuart Mill, the son, was just barely three, the father started teaching him Greek. And, uh, and, and in the autobiography, he talks about his astonishing achievements, first in Greek and then in Latin, when he was five and six and seven years old. And, and as a way of uh, emphasizing the importance of learning his lessons well, his father said to, to John Stuart Mill, the oldest, now you've got to teach your younger siblings. So we have the, the vision of these children who are just, just barely able to walk about, already studying the great classical authors. Father and son went together on bracing morning walks, and as they did so, John Stuart, the son, had to summarise history lessons he'd read the day before to his father. He had a phenomenal memory and was an incredibly learned person in his teens, but at the age of about 20 had a complete nervous breakdown. Nevertheless, he uh, had great faith in, in the essential rightness of his father's ideas, even though he'd uh, grown up in this kind of hothouse environment of intense intellectual effort. He believed it was entirely justified. Later on in life, John Stuart Mill fell in love with the lady next door, Harriet Taylor. But she was married. And for 20 years, with his full knowledge, uh, John Stuart Mill declared his love for Harriet and they had a, an intense, but as far as we know, platonic relationship. When the poor old husband, Mr. Taylor, finally died, John Stuart Mill was able to marry her. And he credited all his good ideas to her, although nobody else who knew them seems to think that the ideas came from her. They think they all came from him. Now, in economics, John Stuart Mill's most important book was The Principles of Political Economy, published in 1848, just two years after the repeal of the Corn Laws. And it brought together the insights of, uh, of, Dave, of um, Adam Smith and David Ricardo and Thomas Malthus, linking them to the principles of utilitarianism, which he'd learned from his father and from Jeremy Bentham. Utilitarianism was a very down-to-earth philosophy. It took the view that society should be conducted in such a way as to yield the greatest happiness to the greatest number of people. It completely left out all spiritual considerations. John Stuart Mill pointed out that the laws of economics, as evolved by Smith and Ricardo, applied principally to, the, to questions of production, not distribution, and that societies always decide how wealth should be distributed. In other words, a society, a society can decide that there should be no political interference in distribution, but it doesn't have to decide that. In other words, any sort of political, any sort of economic arrangement has got political implications, especially at the distribution end. Uh, so that political intervention in the economy is, strictly speaking, both acceptable and unavoidable. No one form of distribution is any more natural than any other, despite what Smith and Ricardo had sometimes implied. Now, John Stuart Mill's classic work, On Liberty, made the case for a maximum, maximum freedom of speech and maximum freedom of action for everybody, so long as they did not imp impinge on the freedom of others. Like Smith, Mill could see the shortcomings of grasping capitalists, 
But he also admitted that society probably progressed because of their work. In other words, they're not lovely, but they're necessary and they're adequate. Here's what, and here's what uh, John Stuart Mill writes. I confess I am not charmed with an ideal of life held out by those who think that the normal state of human beings is that of struggling to get on, that the trampling, crushing, elbowing and treading on each other's heels which form the existing type of social life are the most desirable lot of humankind or anything but the disagreeable symptoms of one of the phases of industrial progress. But that the energies of mankind should be kept in employment by the struggle for riches, as they were formerly by the struggle for war, until the better minds succeed in educating the others into better things, is undoubtedly better than that they should rust and stagnate. While minds are coarse, they require coarse stimuli, and let them have them. That's a typical um, capitalist declaration. It's not as though it's particularly marvellous. It's just that it's much better than all the alternatives. Now, John Stuart Mill then went on to argue against Malthus and Ricardo that the working classes would learn to restrict their fertility. They would make permanent gains in wages as capitalism matured. And then the society could set about refining its attitudes towards questions like justice and liberty rather than this overwhelming stress on production, which was the great emphasis of the early capitalist era. And incidentally, he's been borne out by reality. We, uh, demographers are now familiar with what's called demographic shift. That is, when a society is predominantly agricultural, it'll tend to have a very, very high birth rate, but also a high infant mortality rate. And then, as societies go through the Industrial Revolution and become more urbanised, the birth rate tends to fall, the infant mortality rate falls, and, and, and rate of population rise tends to diminish. In other words, the very, very best way to regulate populations is through industrialization and through the enrichment of the ordinary working people. Mill himself deplored poverty and favored a mild form of non-coercive socialism. That was his dis distributional idea. He was particularly indignant about inheritance. He said, what's particularly galling about um, inheritance is that very often children who've done nothing to deserve advantages are given advantages because of the work of their fathers or grandfathers or great-grandfathers. So he favoured very heavy inheritance taxes so that each new generation would have to shift for itself and work hard if it wanted to, be, to prosper. John Stuart Mill was also one of the very first economists to see a question which would loom very large for 20th century conservatives. That Having thousands of independent economic actors is much better than having a monster centralised state whose practical effect would be coercive and would impose what he called a tyrannical yoke on individuals' freedom. Now, in the, in the years after the Russian Revolution, this was to be right at the heart of conservative anti-communism. It's much better to have economic power dispersed among dozens of different economic actors rather than concentrated in an all-powerful state which has both political and economic absolute power. So John Stuart Mill's a complicated and fascinating person. He's the ancestor equally of 20th century liberalism in questions like his belief in women's rights, the rights of minorities, freedom of speech and thought and the ancestor of conservatives, particularly in his uh, dedication to utilitarianism and free markets. The rise of socialism in the early and mid-19th century gradually converted the advocates of capitalism into conservatives. The great figure here, of course, is Karl Marx, who lived from 1818 to 1883. Marx's view was that capitalism is essentially exploitative of labour. And he prophesied that there was going to be an, an inevitable class war that would eventually lead capitalism to its own self-destruction. He said, what happens in, in industrial societies is this. The, working the industrial working class gets bigger and bigger. And through competition, the number of bourgeoisie, that is the number of employers, gets smaller and smaller. Until in the end, the sheer numbers are so discrepant that the immiserated proletarian majority will overthrow the bourgeoisie, the, the employers. The Communist Manifesto of 1848 forecast the doom of the bourgeois world. And that year's revolutions, the revolutions of 1848 in Europe, again including in France and in Germany, briefly made the threat seem realistic. But after about 1850, British holders of landed and industrial wealth, these two different forms of wealth, 
recognised that it was possible that they, might, that they might all suffer at the hands of lower class revolutionaries and that more factors bound them together than kept them apart. In other words, the, the landed interest and the commercial interest, which had been at, at loggerheads, began to recognise a common interest. The comparative fluidity of the British class system also enabled growing numbers of aristocratic and industrial families to intermarry. Although Britain was a hierarchical society, and although snobbery is a very, very important factor, it's not absolutely impermeable. I mentioned last time the life of Robert Peel. He was the son of a textile millionaire, but the father had bought his way into the landed aristocracy so that Peel and his descendants could become parts of the, of the upper classes. Intermarriage became steadily more common. And you can read about it in the wonderful novels of Anthony Trollope in series like The Palaces. He talks about the way in which industrial wealth is marrying into the aristocracy. The aristocrats needed the money and the industrialists needed or wanted the social prestige, which came with identifying their fortunes with the ancient landed families. That's another example of Britain's ability to absorb drastic changes procedurally rather than through revolution. The Paris Commune of 1871 was yet another of these great scares when a working class revolutionary group briefly took over the city of Paris. And as I've mentioned repeatedly, France was punctuated with revolutions through the 19th century and it was very close. So the fear of socialism long before the Russian Revolution is already becoming very, very keen indeed. The rise of socialism and the relative, and the relative decline of landed wealth left the defence of capitalism as a defining characteristic of 20th century conservatism. It was a gradual process, especially in Britain, where the aristocracy remained important well into the mid-20th century. Even in the government of Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, it was still quite common to have ministers, conservative ministers, sitting in the House of Lords, the inheritors of ancient titles. And, but of course that's a demonstration of the fact that the Conservative Party would prove to be very talented indeed in absorbing the men it once denounced as the radicals. That shows the power of British proceduralism and adaptability, for which the nation's truly uh, striking in its ability. Conservatives learned to accept the abolition of traditional labour rules the abolition of just prices, the abolition of prescriptive status, of occupation and of hierarchy, and yet still think of themselves as conservatives. Now, of course, it's particularly paradoxical that in our day, the defenders of capitalism should be called conservatives, because surely nothing's done more to transform the world than capitalism. It's a system which is based on transformation and not leaving the world the same. But nevertheless, the mechanism itself has come, to be, has come to be seen as something very much worthy of conservation, even though it's a system which has got great transformative powers. Another thing which was happening from about 1850 onwards was that conservatives learned that they'd got to disprove parts of Marxism. Marx thought that he wasn't merely making predictions, he was making scientifically accurate observations which were incontrovertible. That's what Marx's view was. But what actually happened is that the Conservatives, themselves with a lively fear of what Marxism might lead to, realised the importance of making judicious concessions to de-radicalise workers. And they, uh, and they were in fact successful in showing that capitalism enriches everybody, as Adam Smith had said, and that Marx was vitally wrong on this point. Marx had believed that the working class, the proletariat, was going to get poorer and poorer and poorer. Whereas what actually happened in the industrial societies was that the industrial working class gradually got richer. Not as rich as the rich, but much richer than their own ancestors had been. And in fact, ironically, even the Marxists themselves noticed. Um, uh, Friedrich Engels, Marx's great friend and disciple, wrote him a letter in the later days of Marx's life in which he says, he writes, The English proletariat, the English working class, the English proletariat is becoming more and more bourgeois so that this most bourgeois of all nations is apparently aiming ultimately at the possession of a bourgeois aristocracy and a bourgeois proletariat, as well as a bourgeoisie. That well, was a brilliant comment by Engels, and a very, very accurate one. So, to, to conclude, the libertarian side of American conservatism finds its historical antecedents among the once radical British economists, an odd mixture of Jefferson and John Stuart Mill and Adam Smith.